Hey folks, Evil Pajamas here with another Civilization 6 video. It's January 11th, 2021, and in this video, we're going to be taking examples from a Deity Difficulty playthrough, and we'll be using those examples to show how to select your first hero based not just upon a tier list, but upon factors specific to your map and particular game. Tier lists are obviously a very useful tool, but there are a couple things they can't account for and that is the point in the game that you're in, and this is particularly important for your first hero summon, and then, of course, the map layout of the particular game that you are playing. In the playthrough example that we're going to be showing, we have the option of picking from S-tier Hercules and A-tier Hamiko. So one of the reasons that Hercules is consistently ranked one of the best, if not the best, heroes in Heroes and Legends mode is because he is consistently powerful at every stage in the game. Now, that said, there are certain turn windows where there may be other heroes that provide enough of a snowball effect or advantage in that particular point in the game that warrant selecting that hero over Hercules, and this is particularly true when you are selecting your first hero. So let's break this down in our playthrough example which is a Deity Difficulty Terra map with 14 city-states and 5 AI. As Egypt, we located an early tribal village, giving 20 experience to the unit that entered the tribal village, discovered Hercules, also got the first meet on a religious city-state, and a governor title for discovering Owls of Minerva. Because we got the first meet on only turn 3, this is a good situation to utilize Amani to add the two additional envoys and reveal a much larger chunk of the map by getting Scizorane status over that city-state. On turn 8, Amani arrives at the city-state, securing Scizorane status. This is a 100% chance to discover a hero, which in this case was Himiko. You'll also notice just to the southwest of the city-state is Khmer, our first neighboring AI civilization, which is in relatively close proximity. We are playing as Egypt, who has a relatively strong unique unit that is a chariot replacement. This means that we're going to want to research the wheel early if we want to take advantage of the strength of this unique unit. The Eureka for the wheel requires a mine over a resource. There are no land-based resources near the capital city that would help satisfy this condition, so the most likely candidate to get an early Eureka for the wheel would be to settle to the southwest, just along that river, next to the diamonds. Khmer's proximity to the location that we want to settle is a problem as he is likely to forward settle that location. This makes it so that we either have to prioritize a settler as our next queued production, or to create sufficient military forces to take over a settlement should Khmer forward settle there. Now, this location is close enough to Nazca that we would likely get assistance from Nazca because we have Scizorinty, but we have to remember that that Scizorinty is secured by Amani, which is problematic in that if Khmer manages to take Scizorinty of Nazca and then is in a war with us, then Amani will not be able to be placed back into Nazca to, to regain that Scizorinty unless we can remove it from Khmer first. You'll also notice that directly to the northwest now, we also have Valletta. Valletta's proximity is close enough to the desired location that should either myself or Khmer establish suzerainty over Valletta, that they would also likely get involved in any conflict over that location. Now, this is problematic in that there is no way for me likely to get enough envoys to secure suzerainty over both Nazca and Valletta uh, within the time frame that I want to establish a settlement along that river. We've also now discovered Hansa, not the first discovery, so we don't have any envoys there. And that is also relatively close to our civilization, but not that close to the spot that we are wanting to fight over. So we've gotten a lot of new information since the time of discovering Hercules and Hamiko. And if you haven't gathered from the context, a lot of these factors do favor Hamiko in terms of a first pick. And there's some other risk factors that we haven't discussed, besides the fact that we can't likely control both of the nearby city-states. 
Uh, one of those is that if we do get into a conflict with Khmer and there is a city that we can siege, there is always the risk that the AI-controlled city-state warriors will simply raise the city to the ground, uh, and then we lose the opportunity to grab up that settlement um, and avoid having to expend our own settler there. Because we are prioritizing the wheel to get access to Egypt's unique unit, that means we haven't put any tech into astrology, bronze working, or the prerequisite for writing. So given that, the three earliest ways to get districts don't have any progress on them, which would obviously sort of take away from the primary benefit of selecting an early Hercules. Now we're on about turn 16-ish, and it's about six more turns till we get our settler, and we don't have a monument built yet. So that means that at the earliest, if you tack on, let's say, another like six turns to build the monument itself, we're looking at about two turns to summon the hero minimum. So it would be about turn 30 before we were able to get a hero out. Um, even taking gold into account, I would only have 110 gold by the time that that settler was finished, which isn't enough to purchase a monument. So the ancient era typically ends between turn 45 and 55. And this is important because of the combat strength scaling based upon era. So because it's going to be in the, the second half towards the latter end of the era, this would impact Hercules more so than Hamiko because Hamiko doesn't have any combat strength. So you get less value out of Hercules in terms of combat with uh, the later era summon. So you'll want to remember that we are evaluating our first hero selection here based upon our need to control that area along the river so that we can get our boost to get uh, faster access to the wheel and thus our unique unit. So we can't think of uh, Hercules in a vacuum in terms of his district uh, building ability. We do need to take into account which hero is going to likely be better for us to secure that area. The other thing that you're going to want to consider is the possibility of summoning both of them and what order it will be better to summon them in. And in this case, it clearly favors using a second city to summon Hercules. So by then, we should have enough gold that we could just buy the monument outright in the second settlement. And the settlement would be in an area that has relatively high production. So the amount of time, even with the increased cost, would not be excessive in trying to summon Hercules out. And then that would allow the era to flip over and you'd get significantly more combat strength um, because Hercules would benefit a lot more from the rollover. Uh, Hamiko's benefit, I think, would just be additional faith when adding uh, envoys to a city-state that you are already scissoring of. Now, you might notice while I've been chatting here, and now that we've got the settler out, that there's a, a pretty decent natural wonder of the West to me that produces a lot of culture. And the reason that I am not opting to take that settler and settle along there is because it's less likely for that area to be contested and I want to get my settler down in the contested area along the river before trying to settle along that other area. The other reason is that area doesn't have any fresh water so then I would have to additionally commit resources to getting around the housing cap in that area. So that's a quick rundown on why I'm not um, more gung-ho about settling around Gobastan over there, despite the significant culture output of those tiles. Now, at this point, I am going to speed up the footage to 4x speed, and you might notice, too, that I deviate a little bit from some of the strategies that I discussed here in terms of whether I'm, gonna, I'm going to buy something or, or build something in either the capital city or the expanded settlement. And that is just simply to account for, you know, what level of aggression that I am perceiving on the, the part of my neighbor there and how other things are, are unfolding on the map. This particular map, um, I'm getting a lot of barbarian activity and um, that might have to do with some of the build order selections that I am I'm making here. If you are anticipating a conflict with a uh, neighboring AI and you happen to meet any other nearby AIs in the process, I would recommend sending um, a delegation to them um, just to try and maximize your friendship relationship with them just so that you don't get um, a second attacking 
party on you um, if you can avoid it. Again, that won't necessarily avoid it. And also, you might not want to spend the gold depending on whether you think you have a sufficient um, you know, land area between you and that other sieve or some type of um, city-state buffer where you control that city. So I've been pretty fortunate, actually, in that Khmer has not uh, opted to, uh, to initiate any surprise attack at this point. Um, I think a part of that might be the deterrent factor that I've been able to keep suzerainty over uh, Nazca nearby there, and I don't know if he is factoring that in in terms of um, you know how much military that you'd have to overcome. Because that forward settle that I did there is pretty vulnerable, but this actually gives me an opportunity now to build monuments in both cities without doing a purchase. Now, you might have also noticed that there's a bunch of horsemen, barbarian horsemen, attacking my capital. And generally, you don't have to worry about that unless there's also a player involved or AI involved because they cannot raise your capital. I mean, it sucks that they can they can pillage the uh, surrounding areas, but you can let them hit it as much as you want, pretty much, as long as there's not going to be uh, some other AI sneaking in to attack you. Um, although I don't really like Khmer lurking around there. Now, this brings up a good point. If at this point I were to discover the Mayan twins, that they would probably, if I thought I could get them out immediately with those three horsemen surrounding the capital, that they would probably immediately skyrocket up in value, probably even maybe past Tamiko at that point. I, I don't know. It's hard to say given the city-state layout. Um, whether or not getting the extra units off of the Mayan twins would be um, more valuable because effectively, although there's a little time lag on running Kamiko around, that uh, between the um, just getting the Cicerinti and having the uh, roaming warriors from the city-state and being able to to levy those, it's effectively like getting like t like 10 free warriors to help you given the proximity that they are to the likely area that there would be a conflict um now you can see that i am ready to summon my first hero in the capital and that i actually do have a little bit of like he him hawing over uh what to select there and, and that's probably because i didn't have you know uh 10 minutes of talking through what i was was doing in a video prior to selecting when I was actually playing this. So once I do get Hamiko out, my first priority is Hunza, even though that is farthest away from the area where I anticipate possibly needing assistance in city-states. But the reason is simply because I don't have any envoys at Hunza yet, and that will give me the immediate one gold benefit. And then the other reason, since I don't have a conflict in progress yet, that will give me a little bit more flexibility in terms of um, like, you know, how many charges I have left on Hamiko and whether or not um, I need envoys at a particular location and then, of course, whether to levy. Uh, the second reason for this is because I want to make it more difficult for the Zulu to control that city-state because the last thing I would want is to get a surprise attack uh, from Khmer and then actually get another um, attack from the east from the Zulu because uh, Hunza is probably actually the closest out of these three city-states to my capital so they could actually join in and assist the Zulu there if I were to get attacked. You may have also noticed that I, I did complete my monument in the expansion settlement but I didn't start summoning Hercules and that again goes back to where I am on the tech tree because there are times when you can actually summon Hercules and not have enough things that you actually want to use the charges on. So just like you obviously run the risk of losing out to the AI um, who could summon him. But I just um, I don't find it warranted on the second um, hero or later when the production costs more to uh, to to risk wasting charges if you aren't really ready to use uh, the ability yet. So surprisingly, the AI has not yet shown their usual signaling of um, that they're going to declare war. Typically, when you have open borders um, and haven't researched closed borders yet, that the AI is, is pretty apparent about their signaling in terms of that they are going to attack. They just park some units outside of, of one of your cities.
because the AI is sort of dragging their feet on this, this gives me time to build a chariot archer out in my capital and then actually opt to construct an encampment there um, rather than having to churn out more military immediately. And that will be a good long-term investment um, in getting great general points and getting some units that have experience once I get a barracks established there. So in this situation, the AI does initiate a, a war, which is actually my preferred thing to happen because then it allows you to take cities um, with the head start on having a buffer for grievances. But if they weren't to declare a war, given um, the setup that I have with um, Hamiko and the nearby city-states pinchering the territory of Khmer, um, I would definitely set up to declare war myself here. I also look out and have one of those rare games where the AI does not prioritize getting um, the great profits. So I can actually, given my golden age, take Exodus the Evangelist and with that plus four great profit points, probably get a religion given that a lot of the AI civs have no great profit points accumulated. So I mentioned earlier that maybe that uh, Khmer was accounting for the city-state proximity and not attacking me, but I, I don't think that was the case because he's uh, significantly uh, in a worse position here. Um, and as you can see, I have actually uh, levied the Han Hunza military, which is farther away and it would not normally be involved in this battle. And I am bringing them southwest because I will have them for... 30 turns. Hopefully I will not get my Scytherin status overturned. Uh, I did leave one extra Envoy buffer there before I did that. I usually don't like to do the exact number of Envoys I need for Scytherin if I'm about to levy. Hercules is also still available. Um, the production in that expansion city puts him at about 15 turns, but I am assigning Magnus there um, to see if I can get a Settler out there and maybe sneak in a chop to speed that up um, he will be pretty strong given how early it is in the era he will have a, a disproportionately high combat strength score compared to things that are being built this early in the classical era now right now if you are just looking at the field of play right inside of the borders of the nearest city of the Kabir, you might think that i'm at a little bit of a disadvantage but you have to remember that i have uh hunza's uh military coming in here and that's going to to even the odds quite a lot and then we also um have our unique unit that's getting churned out of our capital now i don't have the plus 50 percent to pillage card equipped yet unfortunately but um you'll want to make sure that if you you know if you have free units and you aren't set up to start attacking the city yet um to get in there and uh, pillage those high value targets and that's actually a good use for those scouts as well you, if your scout doesn't have any scout you can sort of get them in there um maybe in towards the back cities away from the fighting and see if they can sneak in and get a pillage you also don't want to forget utilizing the farm pillages to heal although that can be a little bit risky if you're low on hp depending on how uh, much the AI has in terms of forces because they are uh, as bad as they are at fighting they usually do a pretty good job of of ganging up on um, units that they think they can kill so my chariot archer is going to be very valuable in pushing off of that um, advance by Khmer coming up along the river to the north and you can see that he sort of left his eastern front undefended um not anticipating that i was coming down with that uh big army from uh the northeast in hunza so once you have the ai's initial wave of troops sort of beaten down usually they'll very quickly spawn a few extra reinforcements and then it'll slow down substantially after that and the only reason i i can attribute this to is what they seem to be doing once you press on the offense, if they don't have any defensive units, is that they stop building units and they uh, move to building walls. I haven't been able to, like, I can't see what they're building, I guess, to verify that. But I do notice that if you don't siege um, a city, like, relatively quickly, that at some point they are going to get walls up. 
and during that same time they're not really building a lot of military reinforcements so i i do attribute that to them prioritizing walls now because i have sincerity over valletta that actually gives me the additional option of purchasing some of the infrastructure buildings with faith um and that is their sincerity bonus um and by infrastructure buildings i mean just the city center ones so like monument and granary but that makes it it's actually sort of a first world problem there because I, I want to have that faith also to to resummon Hercules. So um, it's sort of like, well, you know, I'm not sure. But if you recall from way, way earlier in the video, I didn't really point it out, but I did take the um, the plus uh, faith from tundras surrounding holy sites. So I don't have any holy sites built yet, but uh, because I have that city along the northern border, and I can probably settle another one fairly quickly um, also along that border. I can generate faith pretty quickly once I'm able to commit to getting um, some holy sites down up there. Uh, you can see because I did hit that golden age that I was able to get the great profit without actually having any holy sites built. Uh, so I don't actually have anywhere for him to create a religion at. So he'll hang out up there. Um, unfortunately, because I do have the barracks built up in my capital, um, that is where I want to keep churning out archers. So um, I'll probably want to get a settler from somewhere else and then um, get a second city up there. Because um, unless I can get Hercules back up there to build a holy site, I don't want to take away from my um, unique archer production because I spent the whole first half of this video talking about how I wanted to uh, control that mine to get the boost specifically to get those archers. So fortunately, as I was commentating there, I did actually get a settler from somewhere else, and I didn't even have to build it because Khmer walked a free one off of that western border of his, not expecting me to have a slinger there. So uh, I get to be the one with the surprise capture this time instead of the uh, usual, um, well, the barbarians are the master of the surprise capture, but uh, the AI has done it to me occasionally. Now, you also may have noticed that I pushed a lot of my forces past that initial city that I hadn't actually taken yet. And that's because I had a lot of forces coming down already. And what I wanted to do was position to take the more populous cities uh, as fast as possible. Um, because I want to minimize the amount of loyalty pressure that that first city is going to get when it gets captured. So because the, the capital generates double pressure from its citizens, um, there, that's going to be likely a problematic in terms of loyalty. So that's why I took that initial wave I had and pushed it past without actually taking that outer uh, territory city initially. Uh, you might actually also notice um, as I proceed in combat here that um, if you do see Hercules fighting at all, that the decision to push him off until the next era um, should be apparent from from his uh, strength disparity. I, I didn't don't notice um, any fights he's had in particular, but if you you do see that, it, it should be relatively apparent, um, uh, particularly if if he's attacking cities as well. So hopefully you picked up something from this video in terms of things you should think about uh, in terms of order of hero selection. Uh, instead of just going straight up off the tier list and taking into account some of the other factors that might be going on in your game. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching. Uh, Evil Pajamas out.